Right, so let's, uh, let's get more into what you should be doing with uh, your investments uh, right now. Joining us uh, with increased volatility is Gemma Goffrey, Head of Research at Credo Capital. Gemma, thanks very much. You heard what Charlie was uh, uh, saying at the moment. I mean, we, we, we're in this um, period, of course, where we're seeing a big squeeze on consumers uh, in the West. So are we avoiding that area completely as investors? I, mean, I think it's quite important to actually differentiate between each sector and if you look at the consumer I agree that the data hasn't been great you know you look at retail sales they were down what is it 1.1 percent in May and that wiped out all the gains in April and also a lot of headwinds you know we heard Italy there are a lot of concerns out there that maybe there'd be a double dip and even Germany which is really you know people have been clinging on to the fact that Germany will help you know drive European returns and actually um, the, the households there are being squeezed by higher energy costs but in saying that, there, there are still opportunities, but it's important to note, if you're picking a stock, who the end customer is. So uh, there are going to be pockets of protected demand, and that's something to focus on. And, and, and where are those pockets, or where are those opportunities in that at the moment? So well, within the consumer sector, I'd say, if you're looking at staples, look at a part where you know, the, the consumer isn't going to be downgrading from that, and they really need, um, uh, they, they need those products, so that'll be quite protected. And then also at the upper level, let's say at the luxury level as well, if they're buying luxury goods, they potentially will be less affected by this turmoil. Absolutely. I think, you know, the high quality equity, the staple trade has been a sound one for the last year. And I think it will continue to be. And there's, there's, there's good evidence that, you know, certainly looking over the last two decades, these stocks are actually cheap. And also, I think the most important thing about quality is the certainty of the future. You know, so the, 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 you can kind of know where the earnings are going to be. Where there are many sectors you have no idea. So I think, you, are, you know, uh, certainly my approach is... It certainly includes banks, does it? We don't comment on banks, you know that, Ross. <laughs> no, I don't want to comment on your banks. Do you not, what do you, do you not have a, could you not have a view wonderful. on banks as a sector? Um, clearly they're not doing too well as a group and um, you know there's some, va there's, there's some value there um, but I have no allocation to banks at this right. current time. But that, um, that which says it all, right? Didn't say anything, Ross. We have no allocation to banks, that, <laughs> says, that says everything. It works on right now. Uh, client flows, um, UBS they put out a study which showed that, uh, that long only investors, they've been steady buyers of European equities for the first time since February but especially in media and chemicals, um, mm. I, I would have assumed you know some of the sectors that, that you were talking about, not so much maybe media and chemicals. No, that's, that's actually quite interesting, but it may be that they're looking for um, areas maybe slightly less correlated. But it's interesting to do with chemicals because actually I'm a, bit, a little bit worried about the energy sector, uh, just because um, again that doesn't provide very much diversification in a portfolio because you have you've got so much volatility there. You know, we saw what was it two falls of more than two percent in the oil markets in the last two months alone, and then yesterday you had you know the pirates uh, setting fire to an oil tanker off the co coast of Yemen. So you know, there's a lot of volatility I think in these types of markets. So it's it's interesting they're going for those trades, but it's probably to to do with the stock selection within that and again as we were talking about seeing value and heading into Q3 I mean how confident are you that the equity market rally is going to continue I mean do we just buy equities despite what's going we've on doubled our equity yeah. position in the last month you've doubled yeah in the last so month. we've been very cautious this year we sold emerging markets in December and put money back on the table recently and that's all gone into gold shares into Japan and into Malaysia why why do you think your believe that the soft patch was temporary Absolutely. I think that what? people were scared by the economic surprise chart. I think that did the rounds and people said that looks a bit too much like 2008 for my liking. And, um, and so I think there's, there's been a bit of a sell-off ahead of that. But the market really hasn't fallen much given the drop in the data. So there's good reasons for that drop in the data. We've had, you know, big tightening in the emerging markets. Uh, we've had a, a big supply shock in Japan. And, and, and that news is going to get better. Certainly if you look at the yield curves in emerging markets, um, they, they, they've been flattening and now they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're rising once again. And I think that tells us that, you know, enough slowdown for now and certainly sentiment shot to pieces but interest rates are heading up and oil prices are still high and inflation is heading up and the data is soft I shouldn't be buying equities <laughs> so, so, so the money's got to be somewhere right yeah exactly and, and, yeah. and it's got it's gonna leave something that's worse which is bonds that's worse yeah, or no, cash I, well the, the, the problem is this whole search for yield you know cash exa exactly is giving you nothing you look at bond yields and in general they're they're oh, what is it 70 odd percent lower than from the peaks you know people are having to differentiate within that and they're really struggling to find opportunities and because people are going down that yield curve I think that's going to provide a certain level of support to the equity markets and we've seen that we've seen flows out of money market funds and we're seeing them actually now where they went from money market funds into bonds we're now seeing them go from bonds into the markets or into maybe hedge funds as well you, you talk about one sector which I found fascinating which is healthcare, which has been a sort of a, if you mm. took the last decade, healthcare has been the perennial mm. underperform. I, look, and there may be some very good reasons for that. 
um, uh, whether it's uh, regulation, whether it's a generic Lock competition, whether blockbusters coming off patent, and actually these companies are now so big that they can't find a new blockbuster to justify mm. their size. Is, is that all in the price? I mean, yeah, give, me, give me a reason why I might want to think about investing in a large global pharmaceutical company. It's more to do with looking for pockets of protected demand. That, that's the whole theme. And um, oh, wh whether you go for a big pharmaceutical, I'm not sure. Whether you go for a company that's actually profiting from an aging population, they're doing nursing homes, etc. Fundamentally, no matter what happens in the economy, the, the, you know, the, people are still going to be aging. People are still going to need that level of care. So that's, that's, um, that's quite an interesting trend. And actually, I think that sector's done quite well at least year to date. And also, real estate as well has done well. And it's the same thing, you know, if you get maybe prime, a company that has prime assets in an attractive sector, where, again, that level of demand is there no matter what happens it's to the economy. It's drug companies that no, you're it's looking at. It's, it's actually yeah. uh, the healthcare providers or the equipment makers or something. You know, I was reading some stuff about, about guys um, that make new hips and knees. Well, yeah, <laughs> and, and I was reading some research about diabetes and the projected forecast for diabetes, mm. not just in the US, but also in, in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, These are your friends from Novo Nordisk, isn't it? Well, for example, I mean, they are, they are leading... The world's biggest you know, insulin maker. Yeah, exactly. The, there, is, there is this balance, though, between um, a rise in risk aversion, because obviously we've got these macro shocks, but this search for yield, which means that when investors are looking for an investment opportunity, they'll be looking for something that, as I said, is maybe slightly less correlated or a little bit more cautious as well. And then when I think you gain a lot more clarity, that's when maybe the beta trades will come back on. I want to get on to this in a moment. I mean, can you find anything that's uncorrelated, truly uncorrelated? Because didn't the financial crisis tell us, Charlie, everything's correlated? Funny enough, I think that the, the risk on, risk off indicator, as it were, the thing that tells you how correlated the world is, is actually dropping slightly. And it's, you know, it was very, very clear over the last two years. But the last few months, that that's coming down a bit. For example, we've had, you know, an almighty rise the last two days um, in the gold price when things have been, you know, falling a bit. Uh, and then the gold price has gone up whilst the dollar has also shown a bit of strength. And so these are the things that are breaking down. So it's not as clear as that. I think commodities are starting to be a bit different from equities. And I think within equity markets, we've got differences as well. I think the big liquid markets like the BRICS, like mm. Korea and all that, they're all behaving as a group. But you look to the outside world, uh, you can actually find non-correlation. Right. And Japan I'm, is a good I, example I, I of that. Think, I, okay, I think our next guess might have some views on this yeah, as well. Yeah, you, you just you just sent me a challenge, and I, I have to say, I, I can't really live up to the challenge. You know, what, what is truly uncorrelated at the moment? Yeah, let's, let's, find, let's ask what, a man who's let's, in this let's business. Ask a man, and let's ask you guys as well. If you, if you have an idea what's truly uncorrelated, write us either at Ross Westgate on Twitter or at Louisa Boyerson on Twitter. Truly uncorrelated. I, I can't think of anything right now. But Charlie reckons Japan is. Truly uncorrelated. So if something happens in the U.S., Japan is uncorrelated from it. I'm not so sure. But our next guest works for a hedge fund, and uh, he says that it's been extremely hard to play the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, as the outcome is highly political, as we know. But they are bullish, though, in general, on the upcoming earnings season out of the U.S. Let's hear more. Luca Rubin, uh, Rubinelli is an investment manager at Zenfin Capital. Luca, welcome. Good morning. Um, you think that, uh, that there are opportunities out there, and, and you are also bullish on the third quarter in general. Sure. We are looking at uh, the earnings season starting basically in the next couple of days. We are quite bullish on uh, on uh, um, in U.S. economy. Uh, we really like uh, U.S. Um, companies. Uh, they are generally cash rich and uh, they've got uh, still very high margins uh, uh, down there. We um, the equity return is not going to be um, straight into the straight line uh, from year to year end. Uh, it's going to be quite volatile, uh, subject to uh, what we have been discussing this morning. Uh, we really believe that uh, any pullback in uh, um, indices like Nasdaq or S&P are going to, uh, to to buy the dips and yeah. uh, uh, and try to uh, to hold some long positions. We really like uh, uh, companies like uh, Apple for their um, for the margins and for the product mix. Uh, and uh, we'll be trying to buy any dips in uh, um, um, companies related to the uh, US GDP growth. Like uh, we really like FedEx, for example, and we will try to look at. Uh, uh, playing uh, this uh, this team on the late, late cycle of the economy. Do you think there's anything truly uncorrelated at the moment? Um, there is a lot of correlation actually going on in the different uh, asset classes. Uh, equity is highly correlated to, uh, for example, uh, euro dollar nowadays, and more and more correlated. Uh, we have been uh, looking at correlation up to uh, 0 0.85, 0 0.9 uh, percent uh, recently. Um, gold looks like uh, being a uh, sort of uncorrelated class whereby everybody's trying to pile in rather through investing directly or through GLD, the uh, ETF. Because um, a lot of hedge funds are trying to return uncorrelated returns, trying to give uncorrelated returns. I mean, that's the idea, isn't it, to a lot of hedge funds, is I'll give you a return, no matter what the market conditions are. Tough it thing to do. 
Absolutely agree. It has been a very tough year this year so far, uh, regardless of uh, the size of the hedge fund or the uh, newly comers into this market or uh, most acclaimed hedge funds. Uh, um, the uh, the um, the return, the year-to-date return, has been uh, has been neg negative, uh, with some ex exceptions for sure. Um, it has been uh, so difficult to play the um, the European sovereign, sovereign debt uh, crisis, uh, uh, as the outcome has been highly political. There is a lot of correlation going on in the different uh, classes for sure. Greek bonds are surely uncorrelated to quite a lot of things right now, aren't they? Well, we had not except, that, not that except for the sovereign debt crisis. <laughs> I mean, look, we had a guest on at the beginning of the year who bought one-year Greek debt, right, on the basis that in a year it wouldn't, one year wouldn't be restructured. I mean, that, you know, that's he gets twenty, he's getting twenty odd percent. Yeah. It's a binary money. outcome, isn't it? Yeah. Well. I mean, what do you think of that? Yeah, basically, we, uh, we didn't like Greece since, uh, since the beginning. Basically, we've been staying away. Uh, what has been really difficult uh, this year, uh, not only on Greece, on any type of uh, uh, European uh, um, southern debt, uh, has been the liquidity. There has been very li limited liquidity uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the, the underlying debt as well in CDS. Uh, we prefer that you stay away from this. Just, just briefly, Luca, you say that you've been shorting 10-year bonds maybe too early. Yeah, we've been looking at uh, shorting 10-year bonds basically beginning of this year, already February, March. Uh, uh, it has been uh, probably an early call, uh, probably uh, not, uh, not the great on that time. Um, we, really we are waiting for um, confirmation from the S economy to, uh, to go through uh, positively. Uh, we are going to add the position on the short side on 10-year bond. We are looking at a uh, yield of 325, 350. Uh, therefore, we are really looking for um, an NFP this uh, coming Friday, hopefully at 145, 150. Are you finding, it's quite interesting that there's this, um, obviously after people got burned in 2008, uh, people tended to have a knee-jerk reaction and I think shy away from illiquid trades, shy away from anything risky, you know, the word hedge fund even, you know, was a dirty word. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting that um, we're seeing this actually return to, fine, we'll go for an illiquid trade, but you have to obviously be paid for that illiquidity. And as long as things are appropriate, um, you know, people are looking to profit. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree, actually. Uh, illiquid trades is um, absolutely much longer term return. It has been, uh, uh, we really like, in fact, on the illiquidity, we really like uh, a yield bonds, mm. specific on Europe and uh, some part of Eastern Europe, like uh, Russia, for example. You're paying for uh, illiquidity uh, when you try to get out, so you, you are actually is still very high returns and we really actually like the uh, cash the positive cash flows of the companies did you think on the long bonds I mean you, you, you say that you were short slightly early um, do you think the key driver at the moment is break-even rates and the expe inflation expectations which were quite high early this year um, which dropped very rapidly and it's and it hasn't been the bond market that's moved it's been it's purely been inflation expectations because um, you know tips only went up you know one percent this year um, you know earlier on and, and and the longs went up sort of six percent which is a hell of a difference um, hence a drop in the break-even and, and that's now turned and again it relates to commodities and, and, and currency moves and so forth do you think this is the key driver for bond markets right now? Yeah, I believe it has been, uh, again, a very early call. Uh, we were not the only one actually trying to go short uh, from the beginning of this year. Um, we do believe that, uh, you know, 3% three, 3 return is probably quite uh, uh, narrow nowadays. So people are looking for, especially from the hedge fund industry, are looking at a double digit return. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, stay away generally from bonds and uh, we generally don't like the asset class. Okay. Luca, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and a first on CNBC as well for you. So hope it didn't thank hurt you, too much. Uh, Luca Rubinelli, investment manager from Zenfin Capital. Gemma, thank you uh, to you as well. It's been a pleasure. Gemma Gottfried, head of research from Credo Capital. And, uh, and of course, Ross, people, you can continue to write in. Do you have any idea or any ideas to where, where we're having uncorrelation at the moment? That's what we're asking.